Okay, so one of our options is that I would do one class in person on campus and one class a week online. That's option one. Option two is that we remain completely online. And option three is that we remain completely in person, right? Now, these are a couple of options that have occurred to me. Mm, last semester, I taught a course that is very similar to yours, um, Foundations of Human Behavior, and we were completely online for the duration um, of the semester. And how that works is that we came up with a couple of sort of um, rules for our online Zoom meetings so that everybody had a chance to be heard. And um, we also had our TAs on board. So we were able to mark class participation. Um, students were able to also do their group presentations on Zoom. Nobody needed to meet each other. Uh, and because students were able to give me feedback on how to keep online classes engaging and keep them going, uh, I think it was not such a bad experience, um, at least based on the evaluations that I've received for those courses that I taught completely online. Uh, and I'm only telling you this so that you understand that I'm very comfortable teaching online. I have no issues with it. Uh, however, at the end of the day, I, I do need to consider uh, whatever the institution requires of me as its employee. And that's something that we're trying to work out right now. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if I will. <clears throat> I may be required to be on campus um, to teach this course. But being hybrid implies that you have the option to attend online or in person. Right, and so then it becomes your decision. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, my worry about this sort of hybrid model is based on my experience on Monday, um, where, by the way, I feel like some of you, many of you maybe, uh, were not informed that this class is now at 8.30 in the morning and not at 5.30. If you are one of those people, could you please just use the, I don't know if you've used Zoom before, but there's a little button that says reactions. So if you could just use your uh, reaction button and uh, maybe do a clap if you are one of those people who didn't know that the class had shifted. I guess only one person has that issue, um, which is not amazing because I taught like 20 students in a class of 100 and 30 in the morning. So I'm not sure what happened um, because I did post an announcement stating that we were going to do in person for your first class. It would have been really nice of you to show up, um, but you didn't. So that doesn't say much. Uh, to be honest. Okay, two people. Um, but yeah, in terms of uh, relative to the class size, it's not looking great. Um, so fine. So you basically just didn't come to class because class was in person is what I understand. And the deal with this is that if you don't show up, then you have to understand this, that the tech component of this online teaching in a hybrid model is very technical to manage as an instructor um, in the sense that imagine that you are basically doing three things in one moment. So you're looking at a slide, you're teaching that slide, you're looking at people in front of you, you're answering their questions, you're looking at another screen and trying to check if there's anything happening on that screen. Um, you also have people on the screen, on the little screen that say, oh, we can't hear, oh, I got disconnected, meeting room, chhod diya. admit karna hai, ye wo, whatever. <clears throat> and who are typing things in the chat box. Um, 
do you think that I will be able to teach you effectively? I mean, I'm going to try, but I wonder. Can you put yourself in my position, right? And ask yourself if you're being asked to basically operate on three different modes, how does that work? So I know that all students are massive fans of hybrids, um, but if I'm honest, yes, absolutely. Health and safety is a massive concern. I actually wear double masks. And if I have to teach a class larger than 20 students, I'm gonna start wearing a shield as well, okay? But hybrid is also really appealing because you get to wake up five minutes before your class and attend it in your pajamas. So let's be very clear that it's not just about your health, okay? Um, so I'm gonna say, I'm discounting all of that a little bit. Now, not to say that some of you who have anxiety um, and are not comfortable, have immunosuppressed um, elderly people in your homes, I'm not saying that's not valid, but I am definitely saying that I'm gonna take your anxiety with a tiny grain of salt. Okay, um, so what's gonna happen is this. There are students who've said they wanna be in person and there are students who've said they want to be completely online. Y'all will need to compromise, not with me. I'll do whatever I can figure out between balancing your needs and the needs and demands of the administration that pays me and employs me and also admits you as a student, right? We're all kind of bound by those rules and there isn't much we can do about them. Um, at the same time, we can kind of find a balance, but I will facilitate you. You guys need to reach out and figure out how you wanna do this. That's not on me. Because clearly you're so concerned that I've gotten like multiple emails in the form of petitions, individual emails, this, that, this, that. So tell me, what is your solution? Because this is a tough situation, right? It's a tough situation for you. It's a tough situation for me. I don't want to force you to come to campus, but I also don't want to force you to just be online. Do you understand my dilemma? So I'm really stuck because these are, you are like a hundred students um, and I don't know what to do with you which is why the only viable solution that I have come up with is, okay, let's do both, right? Let's do one class in person and one class online, and let's try our best to avoid learning losses for students who are online during a Zoom, uh, during an in-person class, because that is the biggest concern that I personally have as an instructor, because my only job is to ensure that you learn, right? So the question becomes how best can you learn? And so I'm gonna give you the link to the form and I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes. You're gonna fill out that form. Um, I'm not, I don't require a name or anything like that. So <clears throat> just give me one second. Yeah, it's not collecting email addresses. Um, it doesn't need you to sign in, so you should be fine. We'll send it to you. All right, there's a link in the chat box. Take two minutes, fill out this form. I'm gonna get a cup of coffee because I too love teaching at home. Um, and I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Um, it, just can you just try and open this link and just make sure it works? It works, miss. It works? Okay, great. Um, so I'll see you guys in two, two, three. 
and we will talk a little bit more about how to resolve this dilemma in the most egalitarian fashion, which is agreeable to the largest number of people. I also need everybody who's got their videos switched off to switch them on. So you can use this time to also make yourself look presentable and come online. Okay, um, I'm wondering if you've managed to uh, sort out your Google form yet. If you have, then please use the raise hand tool and just raise your hand. And please remember also then to use the lower hand tool and lower your hands. Okay. Okay, looks like you're pretty much not done. Um, excuse me, miss. Yes. 
Um, so we can't submit the form if we've um, selected the same option like twice. So if I if for question one I've submitted I've selected four, and if for question two I've selected four again, then it's it's saying that I can't submit. Yeah, because you can't have the same preference for two things. Uh, I mean, like if it's for hybrid, like if we have the same preference for hybrid or for online classes, wouldn't that be like the same thing? Uh, if I ask you what your favorite ice cream flavor is, vanilla or chocolate, what are you going to say? Both? All right, okay, I get your point. Okay. So whatever is most important to you, that's your preference, okay? All right, thank you. Okay, only 34 people. Are you lowering your hand as quickly as you raise it? Because, I mean, you need to give me a minute to see. Right, we're 44 of 89, 46, 47, 48, 49, 51, 3, 4, Okay, I'm gonna let this happen. Keep raising your hands as you, um, as you complete the form. Uh, so I'm guessing that only about 20% of this class was um, able to attend on Monday. And because that was the case, I am forced to show you once again, uh, the course outline. And uh, I'm guessing hopefully that you've read it it look really bad if you haven't even read it. Um, you're signing up for four months with me. You should know what's in store. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what this course is going to do for you, and you're all SSLA majors, right? You're all associated with the School of Social Sciences and Liberal Arts. Um, you're prob I'm guessing you're all freshmen, second semester. Um, and so hopefully by now you're used to the pace of things at IBA. As far as this course is concerned, um, your assessments are not very, very wide and large and you know all over. Uh, you have about, let me open up your course outline. I think you have two quizzes. Uh, you have class participation, you have a reflection paper, a group presentation, and then your final, right? Um, it's highly likely that for your final, um, instead of doing an exam on LMS, which I did for Foundations of Human Behavior, I might just require you instead to write a final essay, which would be a research paper. Um, because I think that that's much more um, sort of egalitarian because I, in my experience with Foundations of Human Behavior, same number of students, but I think it was hard for some students to be able to take those three hours to type fast enough um, to answer questions, et cetera. So I, I just wanna try to do this better. Um, all right, let me open up your course outline. Okay, so, okay, sounds like most of you are done. You can lower your hands. <coughs> At the end of class, we're gonna, I'm gonna go over these results and I'm gonna get back to you. Okay, that's the best I can do. So be patient and be open to compromising with each other. Um, but also please do remember that I can't promise anything because at the end of the day, I don't make the rules. I, like you, also have to follow them, okay? So that's something, please keep that in mind, okay? I'm not, I'm not a bad guy, I'm not a terrorist, I'm just a teacher, okay? Okay, so now I will show you your course outline. If at any point you have a question, uh, would you please use the raise hand tool um, and then I will answer your question. Right now we've got a question, I think, uh, what, from two, okay, no. From Arisha, Shahid, Mirza, what's your question? Sorry, Miss, it was a mistake. Okay, no problem. <clears throat> Okay, a little bit about me, as you already know, I've taught foundations of human behavior. I've also taught educational psychology at, 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 um, at IBA. 
I've taught in the past child development um, to teachers. I've worked with teacher education. I've taught A-levels. Uh, I've been teaching for many, many years now. Um, the teaching I enjoy the most is where students are able to ask questions because that helps me understand what I need to do to do my job well. So please do ask questions when you don't understand something. Um, if you ask a question, sorry, if you want to ask a question, but somebody else has asked that question already and your question has been answered, you don't need to ask that question for class participation marks because you won't get any. Okay. Ask me if you don't understand it still. That's fair, very fair, all right? Um, and I'm saying this because you're 100 kids. We only have 75 minutes once, um, sorry, 75 minutes in each class. That's not a lot of time. And this is a very extensive course. So there's a lot of material to cover. We're gonna move fairly quickly. Um, and hopefully by next week, I should have a couple of TAs who will then be able to conduct tutorials. Um, I can try and make some time for tutorials, or maybe I can offer office hours to you guys so that you have a little bit of help going around, um, going through this course. Uh, this course is, like I said, very extensive and very broad. It's an introduction to the field of psychology. Today's class is actually all about what is psychology and what are the core approaches. And we have a beautiful presentation that I will show you eventually. Um, but for now, um, this is the course. <clears throat> As SSLA majors, you're obviously in this position right now where you want to figure out what you want to sort of specialize in. Um, as far as I'm aware, IBA has a psychology major on offer uh, and it seems to be quite a good one. And I'm not just saying this because I am part of the faculty. Uh, it actually is pretty, pretty, it's, it's evolving and it's good. Anyway, um, so when we talk about psychology, we're talking about the mind, we're talking about your actions, your behaviors but we're also talking about your emotions and your feelings, but we're also talking not just when I say mind, I'm not just referring to your, to your, um, to your thought processes, I'm also referring very much to um, your neural networks and basically the biology of the mind as well, right? And so we're talking about biology, we're talking about emotion, we're talking about, um, we're talking about actions or behaviors, and within all of that, right, when you think about just one word that I just said, thought, when you talk about thought, I'm also talking about what? I'm talking about your attitudes, I'm talking about your beliefs, I'm talking about your memory, I'm talking about your communication, verbal and nonverbal. Um, but then if I talk about your nonverbal communication, which results from perhaps thoughts that you're having, but can also result perhaps from feelings that you're having, right? Um, and from that nonverbal communication, what's happening? How do you communicate non-verbally? What am I doing right now? I'm using my hands, right? So I'm trying to, trying to say, there's more, there's more, there's more. And I'm doing it non-verbally, okay? If I do this, what does that mean? All good. So I didn't need to, I thought it, I didn't need to say it, but when I do this, what's involved? My motor skills, right? My physical body is involved. And I'm telling you this because you have to understand, we study all of these things individually, but when we study all of these things individually, we also account for how they are interrelated and in, in, in their entirety, they affect the development of the human species, but also the expression of the human species in a particular lifespan. And that is what the science of human behavior and human thought is, right? Um, I.e. psychology. So um, when you complete this course, you should be able to not just understand what psychology looks like today, but hopefully also why it looks like what it looks like today. What were the beginnings? What were the early roots? Um, <clears throat> what were the thoughts that led us to, to being where we are today? Um, what happened over the past 200 years that, that has helped us come to this, this point, right? Um, and then you'd also be able to really very clearly explain and describe the core approaches that you're going to be studying in this course, which are very relevant to understanding 
later more specialized and more detailed studies. Of course, for you to be able to understand those studies, one of the things we're gonna do is discuss the research methods that are commonly used in psychology and also what the ethical concerns are with those sorts of, um, with conducting any form of psychological research. Some of the studies that we're gonna talk about in this course, um, you I won't even need to tell you that there's an ethical issue. You'll know yourself, right? Um, but but that's something important for you to consider because later on you may be designing certain experiments yourself. Maybe if you decide to become a psychology major, if your CE project is psychology, whatever. Um, I've already talked about biology. You will understand those relationships. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Cognition is basically the thought processes related to thinking, communicating, memory, um, and learning, right? And so when you study cognition, you'll understand better also how we are able to literally, quite literally perceive the world around us and understand it, right? How can we see that this is a coffee cup and how do we look at it and then understand that, oh, this is a cup of coffee, right? Um, perception and sensation. This is a warm cup of coffee, sensation. How does that happen? How does my brain know? that I'm holding something warm and also know that it's coffee, right? Um, then you would also understand what psychological disorders or mental illness looks like um, and also learn how to be more tolerant, understanding and empathetic of mental health or mental ill health rather, as well as uh, the one overarching sort of thing that will happen as you take this course is you will apply a lot of the things that you learn to yourself or to younger siblings or to your parents um, or to aunts, uncles, whatever, nephews, nieces. As you do that, um, what's going to happen is that you will understand that context, your personal and environmental factors, right? Uh, that affect you at every point, that act on you just as you act on them. It's called a bi-directional relationship. You will understand how important it is to consider each individual's context um, when you are looking at any sort of psychological um, development theory, or if you're looking at a theory of mental ill health, or you're, even if you're just looking at a learning theory, remember context is absolutely essential, right? Um, and I tell you this once more because a lot of the research that we have access to, a lot of the research that we um, refer to is not conducted in a context that is similar to ours, a cultural context similar to ours. So it's really important for you to know this, right? Um, a lot of that research comes from the West in an individualistic society, which is very different from our own collectivist society. And it is good for you as SSLA majors, particularly, to think critically about what that looks like when research in a different context is used in a particular context. Sorry, when research in a context different from your own culturally is presented to be used in your context, which is absolutely pulls apart. You know, um, you need to think about that because every piece of information that you'll acquire in the liberal arts or social sciences, you have to critique it. Because none of our sciences that are social are perfect sciences. They only improve if you stand them up for questioning and they stand through um, and true through that process of, <clears throat> after that process of questioning. Okay, now I'm going to talk to you about class participation. Uh, I've already told you about the assessments look like, but class participation is um, it's your contribution to making this course more interesting to yourself. It's different from, you know, I didn't understand this topic, can you like repeat this? Or I didn't understand this point. That's not class participation, that's just a question that helps you learn better, okay? On the flip side, let's say I teach you something and your question is, and please don't use this question because I am not stupid and I will know. Um, your question is, so you said that children develop uh, most rapidly from the ages of zero to three, um, but what if a child is 
not exposed to the usual sort of environmental factors, will their neural network still develop at the same rate? That's a question that asks me to think critically about something that I've taught you. And so that question also shows that you have been thinking critically and that question counts as class participation because that question forces everybody else in class to also think about this. You understand? Difference between contribution and question. So a question can be a contribution if that question is a reflective and critical question. But a question that simply asks, asks for clarification is not a contribution towards class participation. However, that does not mean that you should not ask for clarification when you need it, okay? Now, all grades are final. Do not bother me asking me to change your grade. I'm not gonna do it. Uh, all right, now we're gonna, today, finally, this is our course outline. So today we're going to do a little bit of what is psychology and what does critical thinking within psychology look like and what are the core approaches within psychology. Uh, we will also, like I said, be talking about consciousness, sensation, perception, um, evolutionary psychology, which sort of says that we've all, our brain has evolved over time, making us far more adaptive and able to deal with our changing environment. Uh, learning, um, the classical theories of learning, as well as some contemporary views on how people learn. Um, cognition, already talked about it. Uh, we're doing a bunch of things in cognition, right? So not limited to just sensation and perception, but also you'll talk and you learn more about learning, about memory, about uh, language. Do you learn to think first or do you learn to speak first? Or can you think without knowing the words? What does that mean? Um, chicken, egg, we'll talk about that. Also, we're gonna do a class on intelligence because it is one of the most um, mistreated words in the history of mankind. So we're gonna learn what intelligence actually means in a psychological um, frame and what, uh, what a very useful contemporary theory of intelligence says. Um, and then we go on to motivation, emotion, how you feel, how do you feel it, what you, sorry, what you feel, sorry, this is not, yeah, what you feel and where it's coming from, do you think about having an emotion and then have an emotion or do you feel something in your body and then understand what it is you're feeling or do they both happen together, those processes of physically feeling and then thinking about it and labeling it, that emotion. Um, also, why is it that you feel certain ways when certain things happen? We're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, we're also gonna do social psychology, you know, how you work as an individual connecting to groups, how groups in general work, what are the biases, prejudices that people hold, where do those come from? Um, and their roots are in cognition. So we're again, cognition really informs a lot of this course. I've already talked about psychological disorders. We're also going to talk a little bit about um, sort of methods of treatment. And then we're going to wrap this up by looking at uh, psychology in practice, right? So it's like, okay, you learn all of this stuff, but then what do you do with it? Because if psychology is not a perfect science, how do I build a career in this imperfect science? Right. What can I do with it? Is it actually useful if there are no absolute right answers? You kind of need to think about that, right? Um, and so we'll do that in the last couple of weeks and then you'll do your group presentations. And because I generally sometimes often get carried away while teaching, uh, you may have stuff left over that we haven't covered or you need some tutorials, revisions, etc. And so our last week will just be that and then you'll have your exam and then khatam. So, that's your course. Um, get ready for very intense, uh, but fun. Um, how many weeks? 16 weeks, 14, 15 weeks. We're already finishing the first week. Um, okay, so that is our course outline. Now we're gonna go on to the meat of this course, which is going to be, what is psychology? Aisha, you have a question? Go ahead. Um, you're muted if you're speaking.
No? Did you disappear? Typed it? Okay, you go ahead and type your question. Um, all right, so welcome to Introduction to Psychology for the third time. And uh, my name is Zainab Tariq. I have an, uh, a Master of Education in Human Development Psychology from Harvard. I have an undergrad in psychology from LUMS. Um, back when I was a student at LUMS, LUMS actually did have a psychology major, which it no longer does anymore, much to my sadness. Um, uh, teaching assistants, unfortunately, I haven't been able to find anyone yet. I think there's a problem with the portal. If you're friends with, no, no, actually you can't ask your friends. Um, so don't. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to find us some teaching assistants to mark your class participation. Okay. Now, uh, what is psychology? I've already talked about this in the first class. I'll very quickly tell you psychology is a science at the end of the day and any science to be called a science has to be uh, has to be based and founded on evidence right that xyz theories are absolutely um, valid because they are replicable meaning that if i think that this event or this phenomena happens because of this reason I conduct an experiment and figure out that yes, this phenomena does happen because of this reason. And then I look at that same phenomena in a very different context, a very different maybe time of day. And I find out that there's a slight difference, right? So I'm not explaining this very well. Sorry, let me, give me, give me a minute. Um, I need to answer Aisha's question. Do we need to practice our quiz one beforehand or after you've taught it? Uh, secondly, the research, will it be secondary or primary firsthand? Okay. Um, all right, will the slides be uploaded in LMS? Cool. Also, yes, I, asked, I also can't believe Harvard made that mistake. Um, okay, so number one, you will be quizzed on material and you will only be quizzed on material that you have already studied, okay? And that means you will only be quizzed on stuff that's in the book and in the lectures that we have already covered in class, okay? I'm not gonna be throwing random um, curveballs your way because this is an introductory course and I don't think, I don't think, that'll go well. Um, so that's one thing. Second, the research is secondary. However, I have had students in the past, and I think I did talk about this on Monday, that they blew my mind and they brought me to tears because they went ahead and they did their own surveys and they did all this primary research and they did it for their group presentation. They didn't do it for their reflection paper because the reflection paper does not require you to do research. The reflection paper that is required from you, which is basically 25% sort of in lieu of a midterm, the reflection paper is gonna be judged on the quality of your reflections. Um, but you can absolutely, and you should be referring to the textbook for anything that you need to support anything that you're writing in the reflection paper. The reflection paper, completely uh, secondary research for a research paper, which is a final paper. It's a research-based reflection paper. So you can kind of do primary research if you're comfortable enough to do it. Although I don't require it. You can stick to secondary research and that would be totally fine. You will not suffer in terms of marking or anything like that. I'm not gonna downgrade you. Not, a, not an issue, all right? Uh, the slides will absolutely be uploaded in LMS. Uh, there's gonna be a resource, there's a resources folder. So I'm just gonna put the slides up in there as soon as I'm done teaching them. All right, getting back to class now. When you conduct an experiment, what happens is you come up with a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a prediction. If X is there, then Y will happen, for example, okay? You design an experiment to test whether every time X is there, does Y happen or not? You do this experiment, let's assume in the morning. And you see that, yeah, actually when X is there, Y happens in the morning. Does that mean that every time X is there, Y is going to happen? You don't know that. So then you do the experiment again in the evening, in the afternoon, in the night. And you realize only in the night when X is there, Y does not happen. 
So what's happening is you've tested your prediction, that hypothesis, and you've understood that, yeah, there's a pattern that's taking place here. Every time there's X, Y will happen except in the night. Then you move to a different country across the world. And you're like, okay, I'm going to check if X leads to Y even in this country. When you do that in the morning in this new country, it happens. Do it in the afternoon? No. Evening? No. Night? Yes. What you've learned is that whatever your hypothesis was, you may have maybe um, proven it, but it does not mean that it is um, replicable. Meaning that X does not cause Y in every single setting, which means that your theory is open to falsification. But if it did happen in that way, even in a different country, X was always resulting in Y, that means your theory is generalizable across different contexts. So for example, when we say that all children have the most, uh, when we say for not all children, sorry, when we say that children experience the most rapid period of brain development from age zero to age three, we can say that with certainty because every single experiment that has been conducted in every single context has revealed that yes, absolutely, age zero to three is when neural networks in the brain multiply to that extent, the most rapidly than, more rapidly than any other point in the human lifespan, okay? Um, so that particular piece of information has been tested and has been found to be generalizable and, and is open to being falsified by future and continued testing. So that's the thing. Just because a hypothesis stands true at a particular time and especially within psychology doesn't mean that it will always stand true, right? Because our context changes, the world is changing, right? For example, we're experiencing a pandemic. There are going to be some major um, and have already been some major traumas that people have experienced, right? Um, we'll do causation and correlation later, so hold your horses. Um, all right, sorry. Yeah, so I would really appreciate it if people could like be on time and and I understand you might have tech issues, but you guys literally like every two minutes, somebody enters the meeting and I have to stop what I'm doing and admit you to the meeting. Not fair. All right. So psychology is based on evidence. The evidence is derived from experiments to test the theories. These theories are essentially hypotheses or predictions about human behavior, human thought and human emotion, right? Which is why psychology is a scientific study. What does that mean? That means that we identify problems in the human experience, gather data to tell us what are the potential, let's say, causes or solutions to that problem. And then we say, okay, maybe out of all of these causes of this problem, or maybe out of all of these solutions to this problem, uh, this is the one that's responsible. Okay? That's your hypothesis. You design an experiment. You test your hypothesis or your prediction, Kiji. This is the reason that this problem occurs. And your experiment proves you wrong because the new data you get from your experiment doesn't agree with your hypothesis. You go back, you revise your hypothesis, do the experiment again. So it's an iterative process. Okay? Keeps on going on and on and on until you know that the conclusion you've reached is for its time, given whatever the experimental setting was valid and it will stand. Okay. So it's valid because it's replicable. It can recur in different contexts in the exact same way as you predicted. Second, it can be tested by other researchers and proved false. That's very important, falsifiability in a theory. Now, why do you need to think critically about the social sciences? because the hypotheses themselves are full of assumptions. Remember, when you come up with a hypothesis, when you're making a prediction, you are making assumptions at the end of the day, right? 
Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of the most racist uh, times of psychology. Kaval, it's fine. Um, psychology is not similar to pragmatism. Pragmatism is very focused on what things are, but psychology is more about fluidity. So it's, it's yes, absolutely about patterns, but it's very subjective, whereas pragmatism is more objective. So I wouldn't say that. Um, so observational, observational research is, uh, well, observation is actually a research method that can be used to absolutely prove or disprove a hypothesis. Um, but you design how you're gonna do the observation, right? You can't just sit on the side um, of the road in a coffee shop and like look at something happen and be like, oh, I observed it and so it's true, right? Um, for it to be valid and testable and um, replicable, it needs to be an observation that is thought through. Kiji, I'm gonna do this observation and the reason I'm choosing observation as my method of research is because this phenomena is one that can be observed, okay? And this phenomena is one that can be, sorry, can be, um, and my observation will happen in a setting where my presence is not going to disturb what's happening. However, you do not rely on observation alone. You kind of need to have another element. That's why sitting on the side does not happen, just, just doesn't count as an experiment per se. So if you're doing an observation, Remember, at the end of the day, it's your perception of something. You have to figure out if your perceptions are valid or not, and how you're going to do that. You will design a survey, you'll design a questionnaire, maybe you'll do some in-depth interviews. Um, you might even, if you're doing a lab-based observation, then you might even have access to particular data sets from um, uh, MEG machines or other sorts of brain um, examination technology. And so you kind of have to not just use one method, it has to be supported by something else, right? Um, for it to really be critically valid. So Aisha, that's why. Um, I don't understand Fatma. Okay, now. Yes, exactly. But Milgram's study was like fundamentally flawed in many ways as well. Um, very ethically flawed. And there's a lot of debate about um, whether he ethically and truthfully presented his findings. Um, and yes, absolutely. Just because we're using observation as a research method doesn't mean, um, just because we can't use observation alone as a research method doesn't mean it's an invalid research method. Absolutely, half of psychology uses observation, but that observation is backed up by other methods, right? Now, like I said, all hypotheses have assumptions. Within those assumptions, you have to pick them apart, right? You pick those assumptions apart so that you become aware of any potential bias, right? And then if you can reveal some bias, then when you look at the evidence presented, you can have a more critical view of the evidence presented to you, um, which allows you to then analyze whether, you know, is this hypothesis actually being proven true? Is this hypothesis actually valid? Um, was the research method used to test this hypothesis actually appropriate for the hypothesis that was being tested. So for example, if I want to do a study on, um, if I want to do a study on students show improved learning when teachers pay attention to them. Okay, that's my hypothesis. When teachers pay attention to students, their learning improves. Can only observation tell me that a student's learning has improved. It might tell me the teacher is giving more attention to students, right? But for me to know that the student's learning has improved, I need to have particular tools at my disposal to check for what was the baseline learning and what is the learning now that the teacher has paid attention to the student, right? Now, this particular hypothesis, the teacher pays attention to the student and the student's learning will improve. 
is a causal hypothesis, right? I'm saying teacher attention equals improvements in learning. Now, if that is the case, am I making an assumption here? Very good, triangulation, that's exactly what you need. And yes, I'm making an assumption. So now that you've understood this, I'm gonna to move to the next slide, okay. Uh, it's important to know what improvement suggests. It's also important to define what attention looks like. Does it mean that the teacher is asking the student more questions in class? Does it mean the teacher is giving the student time after class? Does it mean that the teacher is making more eye contact with the student? What does attention also mean, right? Very, very subjective. All right, now, a history of psychology, yay. Um, <coughs> sorry. The first psychology experiment, <clears throat> the first psychology experiment was conducted in 18, I wanna say 50. Um, and it was conducted by <clears throat> Wilhelm Wundt. He was the first person who said, I'm interested in what makes people do the things they do, okay? But Wundt was very focused when, when he said, I wanna know what makes people do the things they do. He was focused on inside as the what, right? What are the thoughts that people have? What is the human consciousness like that makes people act in certain ways, that makes people respond in certain ways? So he was very interested in the internal state, okay? Um, all right, I have to I have to ask you guys, uh, please, can I ask you for a favor? Um, when I'm covering a slide, I would ask you to refrain from using the chat box until I'm done, um, because I can deal with it. I just close the chat box, but uh, it might get a bit distracting for the other 99 students. So if you have a comment, absolutely. Maybe type it, but don't press enter until I'm done with the slide. Can you do that? Thank you. All right. <clears throat> All right, so uh, he was very focused on what happens inside a person, right? Um, and when I say inside a person, I'm not talking about biology, he was talking about thought. So what is it? How do people think? Uh, what is human consciousness? Those are sort of the questions that interested Wilhelm Wundt and his partner, colleague in the, and he was the one, by the way, set up the first ever psychology lab. So very cool man. Um, so him and Tishner, they conducted this experiment with the first ever psychology experiment in the first ever psychology lab. And uh, he asked participants to respond when they heard a sound. Okay, so he had a bunch of participants and he said, okay, I'm gonna ring this bell. When you hear the bell, then press this key. What he was basically trying to see was, okay, are our responses like super intuitive? So I hear it and I'm like, you know, I hear the sound, I'm like, but when I'm asked to think about being aware of hearing the sound and then press it, I'm slower, okay? So if I'm told, uh, if I'm told, hear the sound, press the key, easy. I'm very fast. If I'm told, hear the sound, register the sound, and then press the key, there's a difference. Hear the sound, press the key, very automatic. You're not actually processing the sound. You know it's there, but you're not processing that sound, okay? However, when you're asked to do this with awareness and less automatically, there is a slight delay, right? And that tells you that we are able to think about our thinking. And this is very important um, for us today. Back then, it was the beginnings of this, but today we always talk about, especially in education, we talk a lot about metacognition as a means to deeper learning. Metacognition is thinking about your thinking. Metacognition does make us slower, but it's very important. 
However, back when Wundt was doing his experiments, he was unable to uh, really do much with his work because remember this is like the 1850s, right? There, weren't, there wasn't much technology available to really get inside and see which brain waves are activating, what's happening in the physical structure of the human being inside, like inside their brain. Um, and so it didn't, it, it wasn't a super successful perspective, okay? On the flip side, William James, um, who was very much an admirer of Charles Darwin. If you don't know who Charles Darwin is, uh, he was an evolutionary biologist. And so according to Charles Darwin, humans have evolved as a species from an ape species. And according to Darwin, part of this, <clears throat> this evolution has occurred in a way where um, only those traits and those capacities that were most conducive to survival was selected naturally over time to enable a particular species to survive. So William James, very inspired by this notion of, you know, only the fittest will survive, right? And by fittest, we mean most adaptive. Adaptive meaning most responsive to changing environments and most able to deal with the demands of those changing environments. So James says, you know what? Maybe, yes, absolutely, the human body has been adaptive, which is what Darwin was talking about. Darwin also talked about the human brain. But James said that, you know, the human mind has also been adaptive, right? How, how is it that we've been able to go from, you know, the, the 1500s or pre-print, right? Um, pre, pre the availability of print, how are we still able to learn to read? If nothing was ever printed, if there were only like hieroglyphics and no actual first language, how have we been able to develop all these languages, right? How have we been able to do this? <clears throat> and so James started looking at how the mind has certain adaptive functions, how our consciousness enables us to survive the world, how our memories serve an adaptive function, right? You remember that, oh, uh, for example, very small example, you remember that, oh, um, I'm allergic to peanuts and so you don't eat any peanuts. Imagine if you didn't have memory to enable you to remember you were allergic to peanuts, you would be dead, right? Um, willpower, another thing, right? Um, imagine if you didn't have any willpower and you love dessert and I love dessert and I could eat it for lunch, breakfast, dinner, five times a day, 10 times a day, I don't mind. But my willpower enables me not to do that and not to kill myself by eating sugar all day. So the mind is adaptive. He was onto something. And so he conducted this experiment on, on, um, on students who had vertigo and deaf children. And if you know anything about vertigo, vertigo is basically a condition where you're unable to maintain your balance because uh, there's a disruption in your ears. Your ears are responsible for your actual being able to stand and balance, by the way. If you have an ear infection, you notice that you're often wobbly. <clears throat> so um, he was the first guy to do this experiment and he kind of found out that well actually the ear has a function other than just hearing because the deaf children were able to respond better than um, the hearing students. <clears throat> Sorry and that's, that's how we kind of came to understand that the ear has a function other than just listening or hearing a sound. Um, he also wrote the first textbook for psychology. He was a really cool guy because he also introduced the first woman to the field. And he's credited with also this theory of emotion, which is one of the first original theories of emotion. And we're gonna talk about it in detail when we do emotion itself. But he basically, and his colleague Lange said that uh, emotion is something that happens because of our body responding. So it's a physical response that we then label as something, right? Um, but it's not like a mental, he, he was not in favor of emotion first being a cerebral response and then a physiological response. He was very much saying that um, all of emotion is a physiological response to external events. Now, you got questions, type them.
No. Okay, great. I must be doing a really good job. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, Miriam, that's a really big question. Is it possible to conduct an experiment on every theory that is derived? Um, if you're talking about every theory derived within psychology, I'll tell you this. Any theory worth its salt, okay, meaning a theory that is generalizable um, and stands as um, an accepted construct is absolutely going to be testable. If it's not testable, it doesn't qualify as a theory. It has to be testable. Why? Because you need to understand whether it's generalizable, meaning will it occur over different contexts or not? Um, and if it's not generalizable, what does that look like, right? So you kind of need to test it. Um, how does introspection relate to structure? Where they're attempting to get a hold on the structure of the mind via introspection. No, two different things, I think. Are, uh, Ramin, can you uh, clarify, is your question about wound or is it about structuralism? Because there were two different views on psychology. Structuralism focused on the adaptive capacities of the mind, whereas wound was trying to use introspection as a tool to understand how the mind works. So two different views. Um, because if you if you also like remember the experiment that William James conducted, it wasn't an observation only experiment, right? Um, introspection was written about where structuralism. Oh, sorry, sorry, no, I'm sorry, my confusion. It's functionalism that James came up with. You're right, introspection. Now I understand your question. One second. Um, they were absolutely yes, yes, exactly. That's what just yes. They were trying to use introspection or getting people to talk about their awareness to understand how the mind works. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry about the confusion. I'm clearly a little sleepy. Okay, great. Now, core approaches that you're going to study in this course, behaviorism, which has been done to death in every A-level psychology course. Um, by the way, if you're an A-level psychology student, please disregard a lot of what you've learned. And second, um, you'll find it useful, but this is, this is not A-levels, this is college. Um, there's a world far, far greater and far beyond the two-factor theory study and the cab driver study. I mean, those are really great studies, but they're not the only thing that's important, right? So please just, just don't hang on to that. Keep it in mind, but don't hang on to it. Um, so like I said, behaviorism. And then you have psychoanalysis, which is very much also a Freudian school of thought. Um, uh, from, from a personal point of view, I don't think that Freud is someone who should any longer be talked about at all. But that's very, very personal to me. And it's also coming from my professor, who was my mentor, who also hates Freud. Um, we hated Freud so much that I would write Freud sucks on his board. and um, I went to visit him 10 years later and guess what? Freud sucks was still on his board in my handwriting. Uh, so we really held a grudge against Freud, but I'm gonna teach you about Freud and I'm gonna do it objectively, I promise. Um, then there's humanism, uh, which is something uh, very person-centered or student-centered. Humanism is a very positive view of human development, of human potential. Cognitive psychology, which is also obviously related to cognitive neuroscience. <coughs> Cognitive psychology is theories of how the brain works and how different functions of the brain, such as thinking and communicating and remembering work. Whereas cognitive neuroscience puts all of that in a lab and actually looks at what the brain does when you're talking about thinking or whatever. So there's some biology involved in cognitive neuroscience. You talk about positive psychology, very, very new, very contemporary approach. It's all about believing in the good of the world and the good of people. Um, again, similar to humanism, but a little different. Um, and then there's social cultural or social cultural approaches to understanding human development, human behavior, and the human mind, uh, where the emphasis is placed very much so on the environment that surrounds an individual and how that individual 
interacts with that environment. That environment includes both society at large, norms, values, cultural norms and values, as well as um, you know the larger sort of legalities and uh, where you're national off and so on and so forth. And it's a very, very important point of view to have because it allows us really to think about how we as individuals differ from each other. Um, evolutionary psychology uh, is again, William James uh, kind of was, a, I think, was one of the founding sort of thinkers for evolutionary psychology, but it is a very fascinating field. Um, and also um, is supported uh, by, or is related to uh, a related area of this is behavior genetics. And in behavior genetics, we look at uh, the actual human genome to understand what it is about our DNA that makes us act in certain ways. Our, our certain responses, for example, um, hardwired into our genes, how much of what we do has been inherited. So that's sort of what behavior genetics is. And because there's that element of heritability, we also kind of relate it to evolutionary psychology. All right. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to check it's 940. So I'm not going to get into the rest of this, which is a very quick overview of basically each of these. Um, it shouldn't take longer than 15 to 20 minutes. So we can do it on Monday. Um, what I will do is Yeah, so what I want you to now just do is wait for a second. I'm going to look at your survey results. Okay. So stay online. All right, your overwhelming response is uh, you want to have classes online. However, I'm going to read some of the comments. Um, and the comments kind of suggest that A few people would prefer class on campus um, for psychological, <coughs> sorry, for psychological reasons. Um, hmm. What I'm seeing is that 26 people prefer, and there were 89 of you who completed this form, stay with me. 26 people preferred to have a class physically on campus um, completely. That's quite a high number. I'm guessing you were the 26 who showed up on Monday. Uh, 39 people, however, said we want class to be online only. Then only 14 people said we want once a week on campus or once a week on Zoom, like one and one. Um, and 10 people said that our first preference is uh, twice a week on campus with the option to Zoom. So what do you want to do? 
because you're kind of outnumbered by people saying they prefer to be online as a first preference. That's first preference, okay? Um, second preference is basically only 15 people prefer to be on campus. Um, eight people have stated Zoom as a second preference and 37 people have stated their second preference to be once a week on campus and once a week on Zoom. However, 29 people have said twice a week on campus with the option to Zoom. So I'm guessing that once a week on campus and then once a week um, on Zoom is quite effective. So that's what we're gonna do um, going forward. But remember that this might change, all right? So Monday, if you can make it to class, come. If you're not in Karachi, it's okay, it's okay. I have found, I've been thinking about the class participation problem and I found a solution that I think is even better than um, you guys having to email your contributions to me. So what we can do is, um, you've used the LMS, right? So you're quite comfortable with it, like your course website. So what I can do is that I can put uh, questions for discussion um, or just like, I can even just put a blank topic and then you guys can respond to that topic, okay? Um, and so for each class, if you're, if you're not able to communicate your class participation effectively, as a backup, then we can use the online discussion forum for you guys to post your contributions, okay? So that's one solution. Uh, the second solution that I can present to you is, and this is something that other instructors have told me, which might help you, is they said that if you guys contribute while you're online, um, you are able to, uh, you're able to be loud enough to be heard by the rest of the class. However, you are not, um, uh, you are not, if you are in, if you're physically there, then you are not able to be heard. Okay, so then I, I would just summarize what somebody in class is asking for everybody online. You should not have issues hearing me. Um, I'm not sure what the sort of recording looks like, but you know, we'll see. Um, okay, I don't, I don't know what you understand hybrid to mean. Can you explain what you mean by hybrid? What, what does hybrid look like to you? Because you're asking me to go hybrid. What I've proposed to you is, is actually the perfect example of a hybrid. Because um, people who want to have in-person classes get there, ask. People who want to have online classes get there, ask. And um, if you do attend um, the in-person class online, you can, because you're going to use the same link on Zoom. So yeah, I think we're good. Physical with the option for online, right? So once a week, it's physical with the option for online and once a week, it's completely online. And this is also in keeping um, with the desire to protect my own health as well as yours, which is why both the days I would prefer to not have on campus, specifically because there are students that are not in Karachi and it's not fair. Physical, you're saying so many things. Wow, okay, one second. Physical classes will be on Zoom too for those who are not attending. Yes, absolutely. You will use the same link. You will log on to Zoom. I will log on to Zoom from IBA and you guys will attend. We'll see how it goes. I do not know how it's gonna go because like I said already, I have taught this course, my previous course completely online. Okay, uh, people who wanna, wanna, come to campus, can attend physical classes and people who want to attend can join through Zoom. Yes, on Monday, absolutely, that's what you can do. Um, now, there were two questions, two hands were raised and I missed that. So if you are still here, can you please ask? Hi, Miss. 
uh, my hand was raised. Can I speak? Yeah, yeah, please. So what we wanted, what our previous instructors had been doing the last semester was that they were coming to campus both the days and we had the option if we wanted to come to campus or log in through Zoom. So I guess everyone like the class wants the similar kind of solution. So whoever is online, they don't have a problem. Whoever wants to attend class physically, they don't have a problem either. So okay. I guess that solution we're all looking for in this semester also. If that's right. convenient. Okay, I understand. But I think I also should clarify that last semester, the coronavirus was not as severe as it is right now. Right, and so we have to account for the fact that transmission is multiplied. We do have a new variant of the virus. A lot of people are getting sick. And pretty much every three days, I hear of somebody who has died, which was not the case in August, September, October, November. I think you can agree that that's true. So our context has shifted a little bit. It's not the same context anymore, right? Um, and so here's what I'm gonna to propose to you. I propose that we do in-person once a week and we do online once a week next week, okay? We will see how it goes. I don't wanna make a firm decision without trying this out. I need to try it out. Second, if there are students who are not physically present in the city, and there are some, I have to make sure that the class is equitably available, which means that there is no, um, there is as little as possible difference between access to, to learning for students who are not able to be in the city. So that's something I would say. Do you have anything to offer in response? Do you disagree with something? Okay. Um, as far as CP opportunities are concerned, think about our class right now today. And one of the main reasons I'm insisting on doing one day in person and one day online is because if you were not able to attend the in-person class and you feel like your CP wasn't valued because you're all IBA students, so obviously the only thing you care about is your marks, um, you can still make up for that in our purely online class on Wednesday. So, yeah. And can I please, please make one humble request to you? I don't know how you function in the rest of your classes, okay? I don't, I don't even care. But as far as I'm concerned, there is one way to irritate me. There's only one way. That one way is when you talk about marks instead of quality, learning, content, opportunity, challenge, intellect, growth, progress, all the other things you could get out of this course, but no, marks. So don't do it, okay? Please, humble request. If you're concerned about the marks you have received on a quiz, that is a different matter. But if you wanna modify the way this class is taught for your marks, that's not okay. So let me be very clear my intention is not about marks. If it feels like online students don't have enough CP opportunities, I will remove the CP component. Your CP won't be marked. And then we'll see how many of you actually attend and actually respond and actually talk. It's very simple.
you got to remember, I have been doing this for long enough to have access to hundreds of students your age. So for God's sake, now that you are in university, you're done with your O-levels, A-levels, inter, metric, all those years of schooling that have trained you to only study something because you have to take an exam in it. Let that go. And study this because it will give you something. Okay, so that is my request. Clearly this really triggers me. So, sorry, but um, Monday we're gonna do in-person. You wanna join online, you're welcome to join online. I'm gonna give this a shot. I'm gonna give it my best shot to make this work as well as it possibly can for the largest number of people possible. Hopefully it will all work out. This is not an ideal time at all. I absolutely hate the fact that I can't see my students in person. I hate it. But I also hate the fact that seeing my students at, in person puts them at risk, puts me at risk, and worse, puts everybody in all our homes at risk. Um, so this is just a terrible, terrible, awful, awful time. And I, I want to say that I'm really sorry that you're freshmen and you're being forced to a be socially distant and separate and all of that because of your health because freshman year is such a beautiful fun time and i'm sorry that you are not able to enjoy it the way that you should be but i guess it's nobody's fault let's hope that we are all vaccinated soon you know um so be safe be well and i'll see you on a screen or see you in a chair on uh, monday be on time thank you bye the office. Aisha, you can stay back so I can speak to you, please. Okay. Um, Mamade, I am your teacher. I don't live on your compliments. So please keep them to yourself. Thank you. All right, Aisha, hang on. I'm going to remove the extra people. I think they basically signed in and went to sleep. So uh, give me a second, okay? I also need to turn off recording. So let me do that.